Hi guys, Oliver here from Spitfire Audio. In this video, we'll look at synths in cinema and our very own eDNA library, a synthesizer made from orchestras. To understand synths in cinema, let's briefly look at the history of synthesizers and some important precursors of electronic instruments. The Denis d'Or, or Golden Dionysus in English, which is most likely the first electronic musical instrument in history, existed around 1748. The Czech theologist Prokop Divis studied the use of electricity for medicine and later for the prevention of thunderstorms. He was interested in music and electricity, hence he invented his own instrument. The instrument was known for imitating other instruments, such as harpsichords, harps, lutes and wind instruments. Apparently, it produced electrical shocks as a joke on the player. The instrument would activate electrical magnets, which then would trigger small electrical current generators also called dynamos. These same dynamos would then be used in Cahill's Telharmonium, which I'll talk about shortly. But before that, in 1899, William Duddle was appointed to solve the bus of the lamps that illuminated the streets of the city of London. He thought that the frequencies could be controlled by changing the voltage applied to the electrodes. So the singing arc was born, whose concept was close to what we know today in the keyboards of voltage-controlled synthesizers, where the electric voltage is increased or decreased with a ratio of 1 volt per octave. One of the first big machines was called a telharmonium and weighed roughly 200 tons. Because there were no amps, it was basically an enormous power station or power plant that was spinning rotors or cocks to wiggle electrons in sine wave shapes. Thaddeus Cahill built this first electromechanical instrument, or also known as electric organ, in 1893. As said, there were no amps, but at the same time, the telephone was invented, so Cahill had the idea to transmit the sounds via the telephone network. So this was before radio as well. In the 1930s, the concept of the telharmonium lived on in the form of the Hammond organ. Now let me tell you the story of Lawrence Hammond. Lawrence Hammond, the inventor of the Hammond organ, also invented the 3D movie, was the first to market a precise electric clock and he invented the Hammond electric bridge table. So you'd load in a deck and the table automatically shuffles and deals the cards. He'd sold 14,000 pieces, yet the Great Depression in the 30s made him come up with a new product to earn more money. Despite him being very unmusical, after two years of development, he released the Hammond Model A in 1935. So basically, early appearances of electric instruments in cinema would look something like this. Here, Ethel Smith playing Tico Tico in the 1944 film Bathing Beauty by George Sidney. <laughs> Now there's two other types of early electronic instruments which I'd like to mention and they are historically just a little bit before the Hammond organ. 1. Instruments designed to read an encoded score automatically. The first of them being the Couple Chivelet synthesizer from 1929. You'd insert a player piano type of paper roll and then it trigger vacuum tubes oscillators with a sound control system that generated the tone in waveforms. Pitch volume, envelope, tremolo or timbre was controlled by cutting and splicing paper rolls. Number two, instruments designed for performance, in a conventional sense. And at this point, from a cinema perspective, it really starts to get interesting as we see those early electric instruments appearing in film scores. I'm going to talk about two of those instruments, which I believe you'll all know. The Ond Martino, invented in 1928 by Maurice Martino, with the intention of an electrical instrument, but the expressiveness of a cello. It first appeared in the French film Le Roman de Tricheur in 1936. Dans le cabriolet qui nous emportait, il me dit que par bonté, il consentait à me recueillir et à liquider ma situation. Il ne m'en dit pas davantage. Composer Adolphe Borchard was the composer and Maurice Martineau's sister Ginette played the Onde Martineau. 
Later uses made the instrument more famous, such as Elmer Bernstein's scores to heavy metal, Ghostbusters, The Black Cauldron or My Left Foot. Guitarist and composer Johnny Greenwood loves the instrument and used it on There Will Be Blood as well as on some Radiohead tracks. Of course, <laughs> in, uh, we're jumping 60 years ahead here with Radiohead and uh, Johnny Greenwood. The second instrument, the theremin, invented around 1920 by Leon Theremin and patented in 1928 when he granted rights for the production to the major American electronics company RCA, which means Radio Corporation of America, a name to remember. The instrument was the product of Soviet government-sponsored research into proximity sensors. No other than Dmitry Shostakovich used the theremin for the first time in cinema in the 1931 Soviet film Alone. Another example is the score by Franz Waxman to the 1935 sci-fi horror film The Bride of Frankenstein, which is the sequel of the 1931 film Frankenstein. The theremin became very popular in Hollywood in the 40s via the scores by Miklos Rocha for Spellbound, The Red House, and the Lost Weekend. And this is really the crucial point in time for the beginning of electric sounds in cinema. Let's have a listen to the score for Alfred Hitchcock's 1945 film Spellbound. Originally, Bernard Herrmann was to score this film, but since he was unavailable, Miklos Rocha scored it and won an Oscar for it. Apparently Hitchcock didn't really like the score, and there were some stories about composer, director and producer not communicating properly. However, Rocha has not worked with Hitchcock since. Let me switch over here to our eDNA Earth library, where I want to demonstrate you some sounds, some of these early sounds, some of these theremin und martino kind of sounds, um, especially theremin actually. Uh, I found a preset, so the library actually features a, a ton of presets, so if we go in here, instruments, we have here all these uh, folders here. You've got Atmos drones, bass, drums, percussion effects, keys. And if we click on it, it has a lot of uh, presets in there. But you can also use the, the engine here, our synthesizer, to tweak. So you can even apply effects, etc. Uh, master effects, aux effects, uh, just separate effects on, on each of the sounds. Uh, each of the sounds because you can... Uh, it features two sounds here, and you can have here the oscillate mixer kind of oscillating between these two sounds. You can control it via uh, MIDI automation here. If we put this in record, learn here, and I wiggle my mod wheel. Uh, here I've um, assigned it to my pitch wobble. You will see shortly why. Uh, I have my envelope here, uh, some tuning low pass, high pass filters, I have a gate sequencer here. Uh, I can assign effects to my dashboard here, uh, in clicking here on favorites, attached to dashboard, etc, etc. The possibilities are endless. Please check out Paul's walkthrough on the Spitfire website to really get into the details of uh, how the synth works. I just want to show you some sounds and how powerful this engine is, basically going through the whole history of synths in cinema. So the first one here, simple horn slider, but I actually want to imitate a little bit uh, of a theremin there. So as you can see here, I've assigned the, the pitch wobble here to 
imitate this kind of vibrato that you have on the theremin. I actually want to remove this and keep this in the middle, my slider, just not sliding between the two sounds. Then what the EDNA Earth engine is really good at is kind of taking sounds and uh, messing with them and having them distorted or create all sorts of interesting sounds. Bear in mind, all of these sounds are coming from an actual orchestral recording. So it's not from a circuit board sampled. These are actual recordings uh, processed and um, kind of put through different effects. So this next one. So I guess sound-wise here, we would, it sounds it doesn't really sound like the 30s anymore. It's already a little bit more modern, but I just want to show you the development of the sound. It's quite cool. Another one here, completely broken or almost completely broken. So yeah, you can apply all sorts of uh, cool effects there. The next film I briefly want to talk about is The Day the Earth Stood Still. It was Bernard Herrmann's first score upon his arrival in Hollywood and the setup was rather specific. He used all of them electronic, violin, cello and bass. Then he used two theremins, two Hammond organs, an electric organ, three vibraphones, two glockenspiels, two pianos, two harps, three trumpets, three trombones, four tubas and percussion such as cymbals and tam-tam. Wow, what a fantastic score. And so timeless. Uh, bear in mind, this is 70 years ago now. Danny Elfman even said that this score sparked his interest in film music. I imagine it did for many others too. According to history, they've used unusual overdubbing and tape reversal techniques. So Herman's adventure into this early electronic music was hugely pioneering, seeing that it was one year before Karl Heinz Stockhausen's groundbreaking work in electronic music, as well as three years before the father of electronic music, Edgar Varese, who famously said, what is music but organized noise? Let's fast forward to 1956, the year the film Forbidden Planet was released, with the first ever completely electronic film score. It was written by Louise and Bebe Barron, a couple that pioneered electronic music. They are credited as the first to write music for magnetic tape. Discovered in a nightclub in Greenwich Village in New York, they were then hired to compose the score. Louise Barron had built his own electronic circuits and most of the sounds were created using a circuit called Ring Modulator. After recording, they added further effects such as reverb, delay or reversing and changing speeds of sounds. 
Note that we're only in the year before the first programmable electronic synthesizer, the RCA Mark II sound synthesizer was installed, and eight years before the father of modern synthesizers, Robert Moog, released his first commercially available synth. In our day and age, however, it's much easier and we can just pull up a plugin uh, like this one and recreate more or less any kind of sound. So with my next cue here, uh, I've tried to recreate a little bit the sound of uh, Forbidden Planet. Not exactly imitate, but um, kind of get inspired from it and see what I can come up with. <laughs> In 1964, the world of synthesizers would change forever. Robert Moog presented his voltage-controlled music modules in New York, the Moog 900 series modular systems. Initially, it was marketed for academics and experimental musicians, but in 1966, Paul Beaver and Bernie Krause bought a Moog modular. During the following year, they were invited to several commercial recording sessions, which make the Moog appear on albums by The Doors, The Monkees, or the birds, among others. The real breakthrough and musical revolution wasn't until Wendy Carlos, then under the name Walter Carlos, released Switched On Bach, a collection of 10 Bach pieces performed on a Moog synthesizer. In cinema, according to Beaver and Krauss, the Moog featured on over a hundred scores, including in the opening of the 1969 film They Shoot Horses, Don't They, with Jane Fonda. But again, it was Wendy Carlos with the 1971 score to Clockwork Orange, that set another important cornerstone for synths in cinema. It also features one of the first recordings of a vocoder. As with her album, it features well-known classical pieces that she had reworked electronically. For this one, again, I've tried uh, myself to come up with a bit of a cue or a, a mini cue. And here we actually have presets that uh, Christian Henson made, uh, one of the co-founders of the company, and named them quite conveniently Clockwork uh, Anthem in this case. And so you, you have kind of this sound that reminds you of that era and that score. quite cool. Uh, to build my cue I've used uh, a few other sounds as well. <music> Trying to kind of fit the sound palette uh, of the film. And here this old school bass which I thought fits quite well. Again here you can tell exactly when I move my mod wheel and here the oscillate mixer moves that these two sounds are separate. This is when it's automatic, so... So now it doesn't go all the way. Sometimes quite handy if you don't want uh, such an extreme difference of the sound, basically. So, let me play you this cue. My homage to the score of Clockwork 
orange. As we were moving through the 70s into the 80s, that's when really a first big wave of synthesized music appeared in popular as well as cinematic music. I will handpick a few more up until today, which by all means I'm not saying they are the best, but otherwise this video will never end, there's, there's too many. I would like to talk about John Carpenter. He is an American film director, but has long ago established himself as a composer and also touring musician in his own right. In his debut as a composer, he wrote the synth-heavy score to his 1974 film Dark Star. And then we have a lot of this kind of bleep bloop. Again, over here quickly, if we were to replicate something similar in our eDNA engine, it probably sounds something like this. Another significant score by Carpenter is the music to his self-scored 1980s horror thriller The Fog. After Carpenter had edited the film and composed the music initially, he felt the whole project was awful and clumsy. Together with his team, they rewrote, recut, reshot, and rescored the picture in just one month. He now considers it one of his best scores. At this point, I'd like to mention a legendary electronic music band called Tangerine Dream. The German group are considered pioneers of the early days of electronica. In over three decades, from the 70s to the 90s, they've released over 100 albums and scored between 50 and 60 movies. The first score they made was for the 1977 movie Sorcerer and from then on they would do popular films such as the 1983 teen sex comedy Risky Business starring Tom Cruise. You are listening to the score currently, a soundtrack that also features artists such as Muddy Waters, Jeff Beck, Prince or Phil Collins. I've loaded here a few more sounds. Here, this one is called Simple Tangerine Plucks. I guess I'll just play it and, and you'll see it. It does remind you uh, uh, of, the, of, of the bands. Something along those lines. Uh, then I thought I'd just load a couple more sounds that fit into the uh, same color palettes again there as well. It's quite cool, kind of drifting in, in and out of tune. Uh, then this Detroit Shuffle sequencer gate. Really, really cool. Maybe not necessarily exactly Tangerine Dream, but I, I think I just really loved uh, this kind of sound and playing around uh, with it. A much lesser known band, yet still a big name, was the Italian progressive rock band Goblin. They frequently collaborated with the Italian maestro of horror, director Dario Argento. Their most notable score and also most famous track with the same name was the supernatural horror movie Suspiria. In 79, Apocalypse Now was released and pioneered the concept of sound design, basically using effects for storytelling and emotional impact. Of course, another very important cornerstone of synths in cinema. However, I'd like to proceed to a next era with an absolute cracker of a score that would change the way we make music for films with synthesizer. It was the 1981 British historical drama film Chariots of Fire. Even though it was a 1920s period drama, the Greek composer, known simply as Vangelis, created a modern 80s synth score using a Yamaha CS80 synthesizer, among other instruments, which he all played himself. 
Vangelis won an Oscar for Best Original Score for Chariots of Fire, and as a result, it increased his profile as a film composer. Vangelis had previously released a lot of solo records, as well as collaborations with, for example, Yes frontman John Anderson. Vangelis enjoys playing all sorts of instruments, he says. Sound is sound, and vibration is vibration, whether from an electronic source or an acoustic instrument. His very first instrument was a Hammond B3 organ, the first synthesizer, a Korg 700 monophonic, but he states the Yamaha CS80 as his most important synthesizer of his career. The next movie score, also written by Evangelis, is a claim to be his best work, as well as an important influential score in the history of electronic music. It's the score to Ridley Scott's 1982 science fiction film, Blade Runner. I'm gonna play you my favorite track of the score, Blade Runner Blues. What a magical atmosphere. It really reminds me of Pink Floyd here and there, of course in the best way. Apparently Vangelis was watching tapes of scenes of the film and improvising pieces in his London recording space. A big variety of synths were used in the score. Yamaha CS80 of course, ProMars, Jupiter 4, CR5000 drum machine, VP330 vocoder, Yamaha GS1, FM synthesizer etc. I've tried myself to create a little bit of a Blade Runner inspired atmosphere here and again we have some presets one that is called Blade Runner horn call fatter so I'm just going to play this to you here I've added again some other sounds uh, in, in a similar vein Wow, this is lovely. Ah, I remember I thought uh, loading something similar as uh, I think this is the intro of um, of the Blade Runner blues, or or even right in the beginning, the intro of the of the film. What is this lovely? Where he creates this lovely atmosphere. Uh, uh, octave at low drone. So that's the really cool thing now, it's with the uh, uh, mod wheel addressing this second sound here on the left side, which is a little bit more noisy, so I can quite easily bring a performance uh, in, into my MIDI recording there. Then I love this one, uh, cool low bass top line mod wheel. So I'm, I'm putting my mod wheel all the way up and then I can play a bass here. This is really cool. This is a lot of uh, fun to play with. Uh, one uh, is called Blade Runner Lead Anthem, similar to the first one. It's quite cool. So here my cue that I've written inspired by Blade Runner.
course, the 80s are full of synths in cinema. I'm going to name a few game-changing scores, in my opinion. By all means, not a complete list at all. So, there's Scarface, Ghostbusters, The Terminator, Manhunter, which is a very important one. And then, of course, it swapped over to TV as well, with Knight Rider being one of the most recognizable opening themes. Moving on to the 90s, they have not been massively synth-heavy um, in the world of cinema. Perhaps a couple to check out are the series Twin Peaks and the 1999 film The Virgin Suicides, which features a soundtrack by the band Air. Moving into the next century, our century, the 21st century, I'd like to highlight a few scores and composers that catch my attention. Again, this isn't meant to be a comprehensive list, it's merely a guide um, to help you guys understand uh, the developments of sound and synthesizers in cinema. Clint Mansell's score to Requiem for a Dream in 2000 has become an important soundtrack in the new century. Especially the piece Lux Eterna, which was even reorchestrated for the Lord of the Rings The Two Towers trailer. It has then also appeared in numerous TV spots as well as video games such as Assassin's Creed. The 2010 biographical drama The Social Network features the Oscar winning soundtrack by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, their first score together. The sound is rooted in 90s and 2000s electronica and they would go on to score films such as The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo or Gone Girl, all three films directed by David Fincher. The soundtrack to the 2010 science fiction film Inception, directed by Christopher Nolan and scored by no other than Hans Zimmer, would be groundbreaking for the world of film music. According to Spotify, it's the most listened to soundtrack on their platform, with Time, the one we're listening to right now, counting 175 million streams. Apparently, all the music in the score is subdivisions and multiplications of the tempo of the Edit Piaf track Je ne regret rien, the song used in the film to signal a kick into another reality. Zimmer says it's merely a game and actually only one single note of the Piaf song was sampled for the actual soundtrack. And here again, I've created a mini track inspired by the soundtrack to Inception. In this case, I've also used our originals epic strings. So the original series uh, is kind of the entry level. They're only like 30 euros, uh, pounds or dollars. And they sound pretty cool. So it all works in uh, ensemble format. So you just have the whole string ensemble here laid out on the keyboard and you can, you can play it. kind of play it with both hands on the keyboard, one hand uh, controlling the dynamics and the expression via your MIDI controller. However, this is not really mixed greatly or mastered at all. It's just kind of to demonstrate again how the eDNA engine can uh, create these kind of sounds of, of the synth world. So I'm liking this Cyclone 2 um, sequencer here. Modwill is it's a, it's a bass. Pretty cool. Collenium. So um, Hans Zimmer uses a lot of this kind of ticking sound. Um, and Collenium. Collenium is when the players um, hit the strings with the back of the bow. It's usually quite a light sound, but obviously this is a synthesizer, so it's quite heavy and epic. Ton of reverb, bit of a phaser on there as well. And I'm using it. Uh, here to build tension, a second layer on the high strings, actually if I just play you these two together you can hear what I'm doing. And you will hear it in context, so here I have the strings.
obviously it's only a short one, but then there it would explode and go even bigger. So I'm adding like this space to it as well. And then we have this kind of pad here, biggest, most awesome ever, it's called. <laughs> Wicked name there. I've turned it all the way down. Um, because I just wanted a little bit of a shadow there, a little bit of 3D uh, movement. These humble flutes there, I quite like the sound of those. And you will hear within the composition, it sounds as if though there were voices. And then you remember on the time track, uh, we have like on the guitar, uh, this movement, and I try to kind of uh, implement that a little bit here, in this case on the harmonic harp and pad. And the whole cue sounds like this. So, I have almost reached present time, and I'd like to mention one more score, and that is the synth-heavy soundtrack to the science fiction horror series Stranger Things. Kyle Dixon and Michael Steen, the composers, create music in homage to the early synth sounds by Jean-Michel Jarre, Tangerine Dream, Vangelis or John Carpenter. So it seems we have come full circle. Let's see what the next decade brings and please let me know in the comment section if I left out any important scores, what scores have been influential to you and if you have any questions uh, with regards to the libraries or any other libraries please leave them in the comment section as well and we'll be happy to help you. Thanks for watching, take care and see you next time. Bye bye.